basically happy and uh, comfortable and growing and doing the things that they are capable of doing. So that brings us into the goals of fish health management. And we basically have three goals in, in mind whenever we're approaching fish health and the management of diseases. The first of these is we want to try to prevent disease outbreaks from occurring in the first place. And this is, there, there's a number of techniques behind that, but it all goes back to being able to understand the fish and keeping them growing in their uh, fastest way possible. But also we need to be able to manage the, the culture units uh, properly. Now, there's a lot of techniques that we can use in order to prevent disease outbreaks from occurring. But oftentimes, especially whenever we start getting into intensive aquaculture situations uh, and production um, scenarios, whenever you start packing animals in, in close quarters, tight quarters, and we're artificially putting in a lot of nutrients, it changes the environment drastically. It also changes the way that these animals interact with one another. And invariably, we're going to have disease incidences. So our second objective with fish health management is we want to try to reduce the number of new disease incidences that can occur. Because there is no situation where invariably we're not going to have some disease issue um, in our culture units. So we just have to try to reduce the number of incidences. And so then, and our third point is in order to, um, when we do have these outbreaks, the third thing is we try to reduce the severity that happens during those outbreaks by reducing the severity. More mortality rates that occur allow those fish to recover and get back to growing like they should. Now, the the key thing associated with that is we have to remember that we're dealing with a population and we have to manage this even though we are trying to look out after the individual fish, if you'll follow my cursor. Um, we're looking out for the individual fish in mind that concepts behind the particular species that we're working with, but we're still dealing with a population measure. Um, a population level management that we have to take into consideration. And this encompasses everything in hatchery and production aquaculture. It's very difficult for to be able to manage um, fish health on an individual basis in production aquaculture. You can do that in other scenarios such as ornamental and aquaria type hobbyist uh, conditions where you're only dealing with a couple of fish, but in intensive aquaculture situations where you're dealing with perhaps millions and millions of fish, that's it becomes very difficult to do uh, on an individual basis. So we have to look at the culture unit as a particular unit and manage it from that standpoint. So we need to also keep in mind that fish health management is a continuous effort and it's very dynamic. It's continuously changing and it, it changes during each phase of the production process. So what you have as far as brood fish, the way that you approach fish health management from the brood fish is going to be a very different um, approach than what you're going to approach uh, fish health management in the hatchery or with fry or small fingerlings. The way you approach fish health in the fingerlings is also going to be very different than the way you approach fish health management issues uh, when you move them into a, another culture unit and you're growing them from a fingerling to a harvestable size. So you have to take into consideration that all phases of the production process can be very different. And so the way that you have to approach those are all very different as well. It's also going to be uh, dependent on the experience of the producer or the grower themselves. Uh, 
somebody that is only six months or a year into growing fish and just starting the farm out is going to have a very different experience than somebody that's been growing fish for 20 or 30 years. The, so the, the person with the most experience is going to learn to be able to anticipate problems or changes as the culture unit changes. They're going to be able to have So with experience, uh, uh, talk about that. keep in mind that with experience, producers will gain more and more of an understanding about that. And the way that we approach fish health management will come along with that experience as you experience different and changing conditions. So speaking of changes in conditions, that is uh, probably one of the biggest parts about these dynamic changes that occur because uh, depending on the type of culture system that you're working in, the conditions can change very rapidly. If you're working in a, like with a recirculating system or a tank culture type system where you're relying on the flow of the water coming in uh, to the tank systems, well, if you have a power shut off and a pump shut off, and you're not getting that water flow, conditions can change very rapidly. Within just a matter of a few minutes, the fish could be dead. But it also could affect the, just the animal's overall health with just a slight condition change, and it make the animal more susceptible, especially to infectious diseases that we'll talk about a little bit later. But again, um, when you're talking about those changes in conditions, you have to understand the culture system and how rapidly things can change. So we're looking at sometimes that these changes in conditions can happen minute to minute. It can change from day to day. Um, different changes in conditions between night and day are drastically different, especially in like pond aquaculture. So you have to take all of that into consideration when you're trying to manage for these health conditions. On top of that, you're also talking about changing in conditions from season to season and even year to year. One, one year's weather conditions can drastically be different than the previous year. And that may have caused differences in how uh, diseases outbreak out in the culture units and what you have to be able to, um, to be able to uh, change with the, with the change in conditions. So when we're talking about fish health management, because of this is a very dynamic process and there's so many factors involved, we have to take a multidisciplinary approach. And we'll get more into this a little bit uh, in another session, but we have to have and work with a team of people um, and these are, these are approaches not only from a science standpoint to be able to understand the disease, but also from a farm standpoint, you need to be able to go through and find people that have expertises in nutrition, in fish physiology, in genetics, uh, how water quality changes, the disease specialist, and whether or not they're more like uh, us as far as Brandon and I in the applied health standpoint on farm, uh, being able to tie the two together to actual um, microbiologists or virologists. Uh, so this is a very broad area in itself. You also have to have husbandry experts, people that understand the culture conditions and the culture units and how you're growing the, those fish. So having that team approach not only helps us as far as understanding new and emerging problems, but also 
from a farm standpoint, having a team of experts that you can rely on helps you to understand these problems a lot better and ways to mitigate them when they come up. So the first thing that we want to do is, so we, we have this major, this, this big concept about the approach into fish health management. And so the next thing that we need to do is we need to take a look at what the definition of really disease is. And basically it's nothing more than just an abnormal physiological state that presents a group of clinical signs and symptoms that sets that particular condition apart. And when we key in on this definition, the key word there is abnormal. And as we go through this presentation today, I want you to keep that in mind. We're looking at abnormal conditions that the fish are getting set up in. And when we say that, if we don't know what the normal conditions are, then how do we know what is abnormal? So I like to use the example of somebody that is um, that works in the banking industry. One of the ways that they teach tellers, uh, people in the retail space to be able to spot counterfeit uh, money is they make them study. They make those people study what normal currency looks like. So if you take, um, a, say, for instance, a dollar bill or a, a paper currency, you study what the original is. You look at it and you start looking at the feel of the paper, uh, the thickness of the paper. You look at all the, the intricacies of the artwork, the colorations, so that that way, whenever an, a, a counterfeit or abnormal currency bill comes across, a person can spot it almost immediately because they've learned what the normal really should look like and feel like. So that's a, a, a good example of how we need to approach this. So you've got to be a student of the fish and you've got to be a student of these conditions that you're growing these animals in and know what the normal should be so that when the abnormal rears its ugly head, then you know and you can spot it right off. And by having that experience and understanding that abnormal conditions are occurring, then you can mitigate and start implementing management procedures very early on that will save a lot of fish, which in turn helps to save um, money at the end. Um, as far as the causes of disease, there's, we can break it out into two basic groups. Um, the, the first that we have are the non-infectious diseases. And these are generally caused by non-living entities or conditions. They could be anything from nutritional deficiencies, changes in water quality that exceed the tolerance levels of the animal, um, some kind of natural intoxication, such as algal toxins that are being released. It could be man-made pesticides that are being released and causing toxicosis. They could be even genetic anomalies using um, genetic, certain genetic lines of fish that make the fish more susceptible to even infectious diseases, but it may have a genetic component to it. And then we also have neoplasms or cancerous tumorous type growths that could impair the fish. So as an example of this, um, here's a, an example of a non-infectious disease caused by a nutritional deficiency. This is a, a condition of scoliosis caused by the lack of vitamin C um, causing breaks in the spine or in scoliosis. Another example would be in a pond like this where there is a simple oxygen depletion. Well, yes, it led to mass mortalities. All these, these fish right here that you see as far as windrows, these were you know, thousands upon thousands of fish that had died because of the changes in the water quality. That's a non-infectious disease. Examples of infectious diseases, well, we can break that into Basically, these are diseases that are caused by other living organisms. 
Generally, we break this into parasites, bacteria, the fungi, and the viruses. And an example of that would be a fish like this that is caused by the bacteria Aeromonas hydrophila. And we'll be coming back to this picture a little bit later on. Brandon? Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I just like to play around with uh, words sometimes. So I looked for a list of uh, words that related to pathogens to try and get across um, some points here. And the key, the key thing is just finding a bug or this is specifically related to infectious disease issues. Just finding a parasite or a bacterium doesn't necessarily mean that is the cause of the disease or that is the problem. Now you have to look at the whole picture. And even when you're looking at um, specific infectious agents, there's a range of um, other aspects to them that you want to consider. So for example, um, virulence or pathogenicity. And even within a bug, that can be different. So if you look at something like Lactococcus garvier, it generally might be viewed as being more uh, pathogenic or able to cause disease than certain types of Eremonis bugs. But even within Lactococcus garvier itself, you get different isolates, capsulated or non-capsulated, and capsulated versions are generally considered more virulent than non-capsulated. So you could have a general um, disease investigation, find a Lactococcus garvier bug um, and not have a huge problem with it, when in another year or another situation, you might have a huge problem with it. You might not know what the difference is, but it could just be a very minor, not a minor, but a actual physical difference within that same infectious agent that creates a different ability to induce disease. Another important concept is, is actual pathogen burden. So how much of that bug is present? Um, so you, you, a lot of these bacteria you can find in the water body anyway, various times of the year. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, seasonal issues can play quite a role. And that means that at different times of the year with different water temperatures, um, these bacteria can become much more prevalent in the water body because they prefer certain temperatures. So they can exist at a much higher level. And that is one of the reasons why they might be more likely to cause disease at certain times of the year than other, just because of how much they are present in that water. And um, Jeff will get to this a bit later, but there's this thing called the Venn diagram. You quite often need some other precursor event. And all of these factors together bring the concept together of infection pressure. What is the complete pressure that that animal is under from a range of things that actually allows that infectious agent to get a foothold. You'll find quite often, and there are a number of studies that have shown this, where if you take a, a small group of very healthy fish in a nice big body of water and chuck bacteria into that water at a certain low level, you will not induce disease. So often there is some other thing that needs to be going on that allows that bug to develop a foothold in the animal. Um, and then the idea around probability, this really just talks to the, the idea of when you find something or find an infectious agent, how, how probable is it that that is the main thing? Is that the main problem? Um, and it all, isn't always, because if you pay all your attention just to that infectious agent and do not pay attention to other factors around it, you, you will miss the boat. And quite often it might be something outside in terms of the water quality or flow rates or things like that. That is the more important problem for you to pay attention to. Back to you, Jeff. So again, why do we need to know about diseases of farm fish? Well. The bottom line is, is, is a monetary issue. We basically have to have the, uh, a production efficiency. So a lot of these fish or a lot of the diseases that we encounter are going to severely interrupt or affect overall production efficiency. And if the fish are not growing, remember going back to those two main points about what the overall goal of what the production on a farm should be. It is to maximize the individual growth capabilities of the fish, as well as the efficiency of the culture systems. 
this is production efficiency. And from an economic standpoint, if we're not being and growing these fish in the most efficient way possible and keeping them growing in the best way possible, well, that's going to affect overall our bottom line, uh, monetarily speaking. It also affects the overall survival or the number of animals that we have to be able to harvest and sell um, to be able to collect that income. And then also probably one of the biggest things is feed conversion issues. And this goes especially back into production efficiency because in most cases, feed in, the cost of feed encompasses up to a third uh, of your total cost uh, to be able to raise these animals, depending on the species, depending on the life stage. But whenever you're putting feed into a system, um, we're trying to look for the best convert feed conversion ratio as possible. And that is a key tell uh, that if, if we're not bringing those conversion rates down, then we are being inefficient on the farm. So that is another reason why we need to know about the diseases and how they're going to affect the overall bottom line on the farm. Brandon? Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I know we're talking a lot about knowing what is normal, um, including the environment. Also, what is normal for your fish in terms of its actual shape? Um, what is the ideal nutrition for fish? What is good for a rainbow trout is not necessarily good for tilapia. It's not necessarily good for African cat catfish. So each type of fish that you might be farming with will have specific nutrition requirements. Um, and either by giving that incorrectly, you can actually induce a problem or at minimum just have suboptimal performance. Um, looking at things like stocking density and the space that they, they're living in, that you're farming them in, again, you will have different requirements. Certain species of fish are much more tolerant of um, higher stocking densities than others. And particularly when it relates to water quality, um, you, you, if you compare, say, tilapia to rainbow trout, you know, tilapia will kind of tolerate or be able to survive and do okay in a much lower oxygen environment than rainbow trout. If you look at African catfish, well, they can perform in, at an even better, a lower level of oxygen. So there are levels of oxygen that African catfish will survive quite happily, that if you expose the rainbow trout to that, they would die. Um, so you need to know what are the normal requirements of your fish. And when it comes to actual appearance, if we can just go to the next slide there, Joe. So in terms of appearance, even looking at things like what does a normal fin look like? The importance of this is if you don't know what the normal length and shape of the fin should be, you could miss the fact that your fish is either starting with an infectious disease or that it's getting bullied or predated on by other animals within the, in the group. And even when you when it's not an active problem, maybe when you're harvesting your fish, if you're not paying attention to the fin quality, if we say that, you might miss the fact that that fish had been bullied or a portion of the population had bullied, been bullied or predated on many months before. And that can point to the fact that at a point in time in the past, you maybe had um, a situation where you're giving too little feed. So being very cognizant of what is the normal appearance of your fish is important so that you can see where that abnormality is. And go to the next slide, Jeff. Um, so this is a very nicely hybridized fish, but we were talking about the external component. This also relates to the internal components, like the appearance of the gut, whether, you know, whether when you're looking at some of your freshly dead fish or moribund fish, just having an idea of what a normal gut looks like in terms of its color is important because that can give you an indication of whether you actually have an enteritis going on. So even though you might know what, what bug is actually there, you can at least have an idea of whether you've got a gastrointestinal problem going on that might be feed induced rather than something else. Um, next slide again. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll close off on that, Jeff, if you want to go to the okay. next one. There. Um, so that is just um, a little bit of example that I wanted to use in terms of 
shape. So those are all small rainbow trout um, fry, all of the same age, all from the same egg batch, but you can see how many different sizes you have. And the small one on the, on the right is actually a genetic abnormality. It's got a deformity, but related to its um, hatching environment. So, you know, when you look at something like that, it's important to be aware that that fish on the right-hand side, it's a diseased fish, but from a genetic point of view, and it's never going to do well, and it's always going to perform badly. Next slide, Jeff. There we are. Back. So in terms of um, stress and stress response, I think everyone can read the definition there. I think the biggest point that I want to get across is that you know, sometimes as humans, um, we, we look at stress in a certain way. And we obviously have lots of easily observable ways of demonstrating stress. That's not the case for the fish because cold-blooded animals have a reduced set of behaviors that they can, that they're not going to vocalize, particularly not fish generally. Um, if we can go to the next slide. And it is actually quite hard to farm without placing stress in your fish. So when we're talking about stress, it can be anything that relates to inducing behavior or biological changes in your fish. And that whenever you do normal farming practices like a transfer, harvesting, um, grading your fish, that is always going to put some stress on your fish. And the big point here is that even though we know we're going to induce stress in the fish, let's find the ways of doing that in the, the least stressful way. And let's induce the least negative changes that you can with these procedures by doing them well, knowing what the oxygen requirements are in certain situations so you can assist the fish to cope with these things that you're gonna put them through. This next slide, please. Sorry, Jeff, the next slide. Is the response to stress events? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. So this, uh, sorry, the slide before that. Yeah, great. So this is just a little list of a few of the kind of um, things that we're talking about in terms of response to stress events or what actually goes on in the fish. There's a whole lot of things that are invisible. Um, now you will have, sorry, Jeff, I think we've jumped around in slides oh. there again. Is it that one? Yeah, yeah that one, that's great, thanks. So, I mean, you'll, you'll have physical changes to the gill tissue. Um, you can actually have hormonal level changes like cortisol elevation. And I think the important point to remember here is that acute stress is a normal survival mechanism um, within the body. It's a fight or flight response and allows an animal to try and get away from something that it considers a risk. In a farming environment, quite often they can't get away from that. Um, and or we keep putting them under that, that stressful situation all the time. So instead of being an acute stress, it becomes a chronic stress. And then these hormonal and chemical changes that are induced become deleterious to the system and actually start having a seriously negative impact on the normal function of that fish's system. And you can get compromised to the immune system. You can get um, accumulation of uh, metabolites in the body that actually impair the fish's normal regulatory ability and in itself can cause death or at minimum makes the fish a lot more vulnerable to one of these infectious disease causing inf uh, agents to actually get into the body. I think it's back over to you now, Jeff. Okay. So on top of knowing the fish, uh, the second of these must knows would be um, understanding the environment that these animals are being grown under. And so if, if, if you're growing them in a pond, well, they're, that's going to have very different water quality characteristics than say you're growing fish in an open water type situation on a lake or in a river. It's going to have very different water characteristics. And just because one uh, particular pond has a, a water characteristic, it doesn't necessarily mean that the 
right next to it is have the same. Uh, we've got suspicions here in the U.S. Uh, with a particular industry that I work with that literally is a couple of meters of dirt uh, for or soil that uh, forms a levee. Um, the ponds can have two very, very different water characteristics, especially in terms of like alkalinity and hardness. One pond may have a, a, an alkalinity and hardness of uh, 200 parts per million. The pond right next to it, uh, because it's a change in the soil conditions, could have a an 40 parts per million. So all of that, those differences are going to be affecting the fish very differently because it affects the water chemistry. So you have to know and understand the water characteristics for each of the culture units um, that you're growing those fish in. You also have to know and understand the carrying capacities of these culture units. How many animals are you going to be able to grow efficiently within those kind of units? Um, the second thing is, or the third would be like the changes in the water temperature. What potential water temperature changes can occur not only between day and night, but also from season to season? Is it going to get below a threshold that is conducive or that may end up um, being suboptimal for the animal? So for example, here in the US, for the most part, uh, we're not able to grow tilapia on a year-round basis. We can't grow shrimp on a year-round basis. We have about a six-month growing um, season before we have to bring those fish out and then bring them indoors. That's why we're not very efficient here in the U.S. of being able to grow certain species because of the changing water temperatures that can occur from season to season. So you need to know the water temperatures and how it can change from season to season. And this is also going to ultimately affect um, especially pathogens that could be affecting the animals that Brandon is going to go over here in a little bit. But these water, temp these water temperatures can be uh, quite a bit of an influence on what happens with the animals. What about the watershed? Not only upstream of where the water is coming from, but downstream, especially the, the types of species that may be in that watershed, because a lot of these different animals could be bringing in pathogens um, from migration standpoints, um, and spreading different uh, pathogens around that you really don't want. Um, what are also the human impacts? Are there major industrial plants on an upstream side that could be releasing um, uh, effluent out into that environment that ultimately are going to be coming down onto your farm? So, you have to understand, you know, everything about that watershed, both in an upstream and a downstream standpoint. And then what are the potential disease carriers? Like I was talking about as far as the occupying species, what other wild fish species are out there and could be spreading different pathogens around? And then we can take it down into the culture system itself. Uh, site selection is probably one of the uh, one of the biggest things that whenever we start setting a farm up, what is the where where is this farm going to be set up at? What has been the prior land use, and what is the water source like? Um, early on, in some of our aquaculture industries we had uh, ponds that were being on traditional agriculture crop land. And there was a lot of places that as, as they come to find out when they were started to build the ponds and they started doing um, soil collections because the agriculture pra practices that had been going on years and years prior to building the ponds, there was a lot of uh, pesticides that had been uh, put down on those agriculture crops that made the land unsuitable because it would have leached into the water and then into the fish and would have been toxic to the animals. So some of those sites actually were not 
able to be used for aquaculture production. So you have to know what these prior land uses are and the water sources before you start setting up your farm. And this is probably one of the biggest things that we advise new, especially new farmers or when they're setting up a new, new farm. Um, what is that? What is that site like? What are changes that are going to happen that you need to know about and ultimately how it's going to affect diseases that can potentially come up? What are the water quality characteristics like? Um, how, are, how is that water going to change in that culture unit? As I mentioned, from, day to, uh, from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, season to season. What are the production capabilities like within these culture units? How many fish can you stock? How many fish um, can be supported within that particular culture unit? Uh, whether it's a cage or a pond, all of these have very different uh, production capabilities and you have to be able to match that capability within the associated um, tolerance levels of, of the fish. Um, so bringing those first three points in into more of a visual uh, way is you take a look at like ponds and this first picture that you see up here on the left following the cursor is these are all ponds. Well, ponds are going to be very, very different types of culture conditions and you have to be able to know and understand what each of these ponds are capable of doing. And they're gonna be very different from cages that you may be growing fish in. And not only that with ponds, and these ponds right here are about uh, four hectares in size. These are going to be very different based on the size of the particular ponds. So a 0.4 hectare pond is a very different culture unit than a, a four hectare sized pond. Uh, the way you have to approach management and being able to, to stock those fish out, you don't have near the control of these large ponds like this that you would a, a much smaller pond. So understanding those differences in ponds is, is quite different. Um, tank culture type situations that you see here on the far right um, can be very different from tank to tank and the size of tanks. Um, the size of animals that are actually grown in these tanks could be very different. Um, when we start getting into cage work, uh, this is probably one, one area that most of you are familiar with. You know, uh, just because it's a cage, well, it's not necessarily just a cage. The way you have to approach those cages are very different. You take a 10 to 20 meter diameter uh, open water cage like this, well, you approach the management of those and the production capability of these types of cages very different than a much smaller cage where you can do um, a, a more high density type management system um, within these smaller cages like this. So, and I mentioned site selection and the changes in water quality and the production characteristics. And this is a satellite photo of a cage operation um, on a river. And this arrow up on the top shows the flow direction of the water in the river. Well, look at the way that these cages are situated. And we were talking about not only site selection, but how do we structure and place those cages within that particular body of water? The fish that are grown up here on this top end that is where water flow is coming in first are going to behave and probably produce very differently than the fish that I've got circled in these cages down here at the bottom end, because all the new uh, the metabolic waste that's being generated in these cages on this top end versus the bottom is going to be completely different, and so you probably are going to have to manage these these cages these cages down on this 
downflow side very differently. The fish are going to have more problems probably in general, but you have to be able to take that into consideration and know your setup and how these individual cages can potentially um, change depending on the environmental conditions. You also have to be able to protect uh, your culture units from predators because they can add uh, added stressors to the animals um, and, and being scaring the animals to the point we're not very well. You are able to anticipate and be observant of changes in all the things that we've been talking about, especially uh, these changes in water quality parameters or temperatures. So in a pond type situation, if you don't have any aeration and one day you notice it's a nice green coloration, nice algal bloom on the pond and you go back the next day and it's completely changed to different color green or even turned brown where you've lost the algal bloom. Well, how is that potentially going to change your water quality? Probably from an oxygen standpoint, you're going to have some major problems. So when you're talking about these culture systems, you have to be very observant about these day-to-day -day changes that are going on and how those changes can affect the overall um, biology of the animal and how they respond to these changing conditions. And then associated with that, one of the biggest things about these culture systems that you need to know is keeping good records. And that is a vital part of disease management because oftentimes as we'll get into and brand prior to a mortality event and without good record keeping both not only where these fish are coming from the sources that they're coming from but also water quality dissolved oxygen being able to look back over these slight changes can be a real key point into understanding what the ultimate cause of disease is brandon Thanks, Jeff. Um, I just wanted to, um, and this comes a bit to this point as well, um, go back to something Jeff said quite a long time ago at the beginning of the presentation about a multidisciplinary approach, multidisciplinary team. And this, this, you know, not any one person can know everything you need to know when you're, when you're farming in, in a fish enterprise. Um, and you know, quite often you're going to want to get some input from other specialists <clears throat> um, and, and get insight from someone who's maybe looked at a lot of different things and a lot of different situations. And this is where record keeping is absolutely critical um, for, for any external consultant or external party or even a veterinarian that works with you a lot. For you to get real value out of him and for him to, or that person, him or her, to do their job well, it's, it's almost impossible if you don't have um, decent records. Uh, it makes a, a really important part of, of our whole diagnostic investigation to actually look at what your various water parameter readings have been, what your mortality rate has been. Um, and in, in, in terms of this, particularly with when we talk about mortalities, there's also the accuracy of it. So. Now, we completely understand that sometimes it can feel very difficult to make the time for this. Um, and, and particularly if you're a small farmer, you, it makes it really difficult. It's something you're having to do at night rather than during the day. But it's critical data and that you only have one opportunity to get it. You know, every week or every month that goes past that you haven't accumulated that data, it's lost forever. You know, you can't go back in time and find it. So it really, really is important to make as much effort as you can to keep it, try, try and keep it as accurate as possible, particularly when it comes to mortalities, you know, where if you only collect mortalities once a week, you know, we're only getting one data point per week. 
and you can have this big surge in morts and you wouldn't know which day in the week that related to. Um, in terms of the other side about record keeping as well, and, and we've said this a few, point, few times before, is knowing what is normal and what is abnormal. If you haven't been measuring something regularly over time, you don't actually know what is normal. You might know what you would like it to be. You might know what your fish would like, but you don't actually know what is your normal in your, your space. And quite often with certain types of things, oxygen, alkalinity, pH, it sometimes is not so much about what the absolute value is um, within certain confines. It's actually about the rate of change. So you can sometimes have a DO drop early in the morning, um, and, that, and that sudden drop is what actually causes the fish to die or have a lot of stress because they don't have time to adapt to it. A good example is me or Jeff living in where we normally do, we okay going to the top of Mount Everest, um, we're not going to do very well at all. Whereas someone who lives in the Himalayas, a Sherpa, they will survive there pretty comfortably in a space or an altitude that we'd actually die at. Just because of the rapidity of change is not what our systems have adapted to. So, you know, this is something else that's really critical to know. What is the normal for your system? So when there's a sudden change, you can overlay that with any mm, disease or mortalities you see on your actual farm. And then the other part of this is by keeping good records of this over time, you can start to see patterns. You can start to see patterns associated to rainfall. You can start to see patterns of change associated to season. And that allows you to develop predictive ability, maybe not totally accurately, but you can start to anticipate things and put prophylactic strategies in place, whether it's a changed feeding pattern, whether it's moving to a different part, uh, if you're doing open water farming in a dam, you can move to a different part of the dam because you know at a certain time of the year, the water quality changes in that area. It allows you to start anticipating things. So this whole idea around record keeping, it is not, it's not just about um, a paperwork exercise. It's an incredibly important part of what we use to try and work out what's going on in your farm. I think it's back to you, Jeff. What is it? Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's still me. Um, yeah. I just wanted to talk a little bit about here about mortality rate. Um, so there's a big difference between what um, a lot of farms might accept as mortality rate and that their farm can still be profitable and they can still function and, 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 and continue to do it and make money out of it, what I kind of call um, a farm economic mortality rate, that is a completely different number from what we look at it from a health perspective. From a health perspective, any population should function, if it's a perfectly healthy population, should function at a certain very low mortality rate. And that tends to be quite consistent across species, humans, fish, cats, dogs, cattle. If you're looking at a big enough population, that sit, number sits very, very low. You know, 0.07% 0 0 per week to maybe 0.1% per week. And the point of this is that the moment you start moving further and further away from that rate, what it tells you is that your population is not completely healthy. There's something going on. It might be something that you can't do anything about, but it tells you that there is a health issue at some level, whether it's a water quality thing, an dis infectious disease agent, but it's a trigger to tell you to start looking for where, is there something wrong? Can I do something about it? So next slide, Jeff. Um, so in terms of, this is now sort of going on to a different topic a little bit, um, but still talking about um, knowing, knowing what is normal. Um, so know, know what is normal behavior for your fish and know what they normally look like. Quite often behavior change, might precede clinical signs, clinical lesions, and particularly when we're talking about negative environmental parameters. So understand what is good schooling, what is a good feed response, understand when you look in your fish population, do you have a lot of fish that are hanging around the cage, the edge of the cage, rather than in a nice group together? Because all of those kind of things can indicate to you that something is coming. Um, one of the things that we've seen before in certain open water systems when 
a whole big group of the fish would start surf, uh, swimming very much more up the surface. Over time, it became evident that they were actually telling us that there was a negative water quality change coming to do with this deep water body. And it was actually after time we learned that that change in behavior indicated a negative water quality event coming and gave us a little bit of warning to try to do something about it. But if you did not recognize that being an abnormal behavior, you would miss it completely. Um, next slide. Um, we'll just run through these very quickly. So, you know, again, just top right picture. Obviously, it's a dead fish, but, you know, your gill should be nice and red. That's more normal gill tissue as opposed to the one the bottom left where you've got pale and the one at the bottom right eroded. So, again, you know, you would need to know that that bottom right picture is not normal. Even if you don't know what's causing it, you need to know it's not normal. Next slide. Um, what is a normal body shape? No, um, you know, you have some of these ornamental fish where having a swollen belly and big bulging eyes could be quite normal. Um, if that was a rainbow trout or a tilapia, that's not normal. So understand what is a normal body shape on every level. Um, next slide, Jeff. Sorry, Jeff, next slide. Um, and then also um, here, we've got a whole lot of kind of symptoms. You know, the, the picture at the top left is just a fish with a lot of hemorrhage. You need to know that that's abnormal, but um, the, the thing to also bear in mind is not specific. There are a lot of different things that could make a fish look inflamed and hemorrhagic everywhere. Next slide. Sorry, Jeff, next slide. Sorry, we got a little bit of a delay going yeah. on. <laughs> That's all right, no problem. All right. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the um, go back to the one with the um, uh, sweat. Yeah, that one, the ascites. The ascites. Um, okay. Yeah, perfect. Sorry perfect. about that. Um, and then just in terms of you know what is normal, abnormal, just the process when you go through and look at it. You know, you might go, okay, fine, that's a swollen belly, that's not normal. Don't make assumptions about it. And we'll go into a lot more detail on this in one of the other talks, but also open that abdomen. If you just looked at fish on, this, on the outside, you might assume it's ascites. Well, it wasn't. It was actually a swollen stomach for completely different reasons. So it's a good idea to get used to actually opening your fish up and getting an idea of what that looks like inside. Next slide. Um, and this is quite an important point and talks a little bit to before where I was talking that it's hard to farm without placing some stress on your fish or some negative impact, shall I rather say. So a lot of the things that we do might cause low-level abrasions and any low-level abrasion, even if you can't see it with your naked eye, there's some stripping of the mucus, there's some negative um, or there's some negative insult to impact that reduces that fish's ability to um, resist infectious agents getting in. So abrasions can be a source of a foothold. Um, they can get in via the mouth, they can get in via the gills, they can get in via the nose. So there are a lot of areas where bugs can get in. And sometimes we don't always know where that is. For example, there's been a long-standing investigation in shrimp trying to find out exactly how and where white spot got in where people would take white shrimp, expose them to white spot, wouldn't necessarily get the problem, couldn't find where it got in. And they eventually found that there's this funny little gland near the, the anal area, and that's actually where the, the virus gets in. So you always need a portal of entry. Next slide. And I think this is quite an important point, and it speaks a bit to record keeping as well, is that not all infections are equal. You know, you get acute, which is kind of immediate. Things are all happening very, very quickly. Mass mortalities, everything's going wrong over a few days. To subacute with things, you know, acute would be, for example, certain viral infections can definitely do that. Um, subacute is of a slightly long time frame. Again, fairly obvious to most people. But I think one of the things a lot often can be missed are these chronic infections and latent infections, particularly chronic infections where you'll get this low level increased 
mortality or poorer performance, you're not even getting necessarily an increased mortality, but a chronic poor performance that can actually be um, attributed to certain infectious disease agents. Next slide, Jeff. I think it's back to you now. Okay. Yeah. So also as part of understanding the diseases and especially with the pathogens that cause these diseases, we need to know and understand, well, are these, are these pathogens considered to be one of two types? Uh, the first of these are called obligate pathogens, and these are ones that are normally absent unless there is a proper host within that population. That, that particular pathogen can infect and then result in disease-type clinical signs development and then mortalities. Uh, clear examples of an obligate pathogen would be viruses. Um, there's also some bacteria and some parasites that are considered to be obligate. And so again, if the proper host is not present as far as the fish host, then there are some viruses that will not be able to infect those particular animals, there is no need, there's no threat to it. But if you're working with a particular species of fish, it is, it is important for you to understand what particular pathogens are, are uh, that those fish are susceptible to, especially in these viral realms and a lot of these bacteria and parasites. The other part of that is the other branch of these particular organisms that we look at are what we consider the facultative. And by far, this is probably one of the, the larger groups that we tend to see a lot of problems with, especially whenever we have animals that are stressed, we're not taking care of them uh, very well, because these are organisms that are present in the environment and can cause disease in a susceptible host. There, uh, we have certain bacteria and certain parasites that are in every freshwater system around the world, regardless of water temperatures. Uh, it can be anywhere. An example of this would be like a bacteria called Aramonas hydrophila. They're present worldwide. And regardless of what you do, you're not going to be able to completely clear the the environment or the culture units out from these pathogens. They're ones that you're going to always have to contend with, and you have to be aware that these pathogens are out there. So you need to understand that there are two broad groups of these pathogens, and how you manage for them can be very different. And we'll go over that again in another session and come back to this point. The other thing that we need to understand is how pathogens are spread around. Uh, and we call these vectors. Uh, these are animals that, are, that have the potential of introducing pathogens into uh, an environment or a culture unit. They can be other fish that are present in the environment. This is especially true where you're growing fish in cages on uh, large bodies of water where wild fish are available. How do those fish uh, spread pathogens that are in the open part of the lake, and how does it impact your fish that you're trying to grow in cages? Um, some pathogens have birds that are involved in their life cycle. Uh, I'll give an example of that here in just a second. What about carrier fish within the population? Some of these pathogens establish long-term carrier states, and they hide out, they're in very low numbers, but the fish cannot completely clear those pathogens out of their system. And so at some point, those pathogens begin to grow and overtake and become shed out into the water or there, uh, there's some cannibalism that goes on that can spread those particular pathogens around within the population. And this is how a lot of um, pathogens and diseases start getting introduced into new geographical areas, especially with emerging disease issues, is because there are carrier fish that are harboring these pathogens in very low numbers, and people don't do a good job of getting um, 
good health certifications before they bring fish into a, a, a new area. And those animals are bringing in potential very nasty pathogens that could devastate a population um, and even an industry. And we'll talk more about that uh, in another session. So as an example of a vector and how other animals are uh, involved in the potential life cycle, we have like digenetic trematodes. Well, the, the species that we're most concerned with is our fish, but birds could be um, a very important part of a particular life cycle of certain pathogens, as well as invertebrates such as these snails right here. What is the predominant water temperature of occurrence for certain diseases? Some of these pathogens have very, very narrow water temperatures in which they are able to um, cause disease in. So, for example, in Edwards Tillery, or um, it causes a disease called Bacillus necrosis in certain types of catfish. Um, it has a very narrow window of water temperature in which it can cause disease, 25 to 29 degrees C. Um, but, but you have other pathogens such as Aramonas hydrophila that has a very broad water temperature in which it can grow and cause disease in. So like with Aramonas, it can cause disease anywhere between 10 all the way up to 35 degrees C, very broad water temperature in which it can grow and cause problems in. So we talked a little bit about knowing the clinical signs of some, some of these diseases already, and we'll come back to that again in, an, in another session. And then also in another session, but it's an important part to keep in mind here in this introductory area, is what are all the methods of correction for a particular disease? Certain chemicals or antibiotics may be available and are good tools to use into correcting a problem. But there are other diseases where a certain antibiotic may not do anything. You're completely wasting your money and, and by even applying it to the fish. So you have to know what the methods of correction are like. And it may be something as simple as a water exchange or correcting the water chemistry to prevent a lot of these diseases from happening. And again, we'll come back to that and we've got a, a treatment session planned and we'll, we'll talk about that more later on in, the, in another session. Um, the mortality rates, as Brandon had mentioned, is, uh, is something of major concern and it really tells us a lot about to the farm. You have to know what that potential threat is and what kind of potential economic damage it could potentially take on the farm if a particular disease got onto the farm and when you're not following proper biosecurity protocols. So what are those potential mortality rates and patterns like? And again, we can, we can when we go through and we look at these different mortality rates, it allows us from a diagnostic standpoint and even from, from your standpoint as a, a producer to help guide you in understanding what the potential cause is. So we gave that definition, those definitions of these a little bit earlier on about uh, a per acute or acute type mortality events. This would be an example as the total percent of animals that end up dying because of a mortality event. And a per acute like this happens very rapidly, usually oftentimes within just a matter of hours to uh, one or two days. And and it results in 100% loss of your fish. Well, oftentimes this is a result of either a water quality issue or a potential toxicant that has been, um, that is involved in the culture unit. When we start getting into these acute or subacute or even chronic type mortality events, 
typically it doesn't lead to a hundred percent mortality rate, but you know, if it leads to 50%, well, that can tell us that we're still dealing with a very virulent organism. It's going to be spread out over a long period of time. And we have to know and understand how this disease is going to work its process out over that time and how it's going to affect your overall management of the farm and what you can expect. You take a look at this chronic type of event, well, this is something that is, is one that can lead to, you know, be caused by a variety of different scenarios. This could be something where it's a low virulent type of virus or bacteria or a parasite where it doesn't really necessarily cause a, a large number of mortalities, but it's something that is just problematic. And eventually it does become a problem that that has to be rectified. It could also be something that where we typically see um, an indication of a nutritional deficiency that just builds up over time. So understanding these mortality patterns will help you to understand what the potential cause is, as well as the urgency in which you need to be able to make corrections to help save a lot of fish. Um, we talked about mortality rates, the transmission, and how um, these particular pathogens could be potentially in, um, introduced into or spread around a population. It could come from um, infected feed, for example, mycotoxins that are in feed. Um, if you're using um, a fresh fish meal, uh, that you're doing like a homemade feed, well, the, the fish that you're using still could harbor pathogens that if you're using that to feed fish could spread a particular pathogen around. Generally in manufactured feed, the temperatures get to the point where it kills out most pathogens, but it is something to uh, consider on how some of these pathogens can be spread. Again, um, whether or not there's infected or carrier fish that are being introduced into the population and what that source of infection is coming from. The other part about this, this last point, inanimate objects and equipment, and we'll talk more about this in another session whenever we get especially into biosecurity protocols, but inanimate objects or equipment such as hauling tanks, nets, um, if you're not properly disinfecting those particular items, you don't want to be using uh, a net to pick up uh, fish that are dying and then use that same net later on to go and start harvesting fish that are completely healthy because you may start spreading uh, the pathogen around without any kind of disinfection in between. But it's always good to have good equipment and plenty of equipment that you can use for normal day-to-day -day operations versus ones that are used to pick up mortalities, but make sure that you have this good disinfection that is uh, that you can implement with these equipment. And again, and is how these particular pathogens can be transmitted from fish to fish. And there's two general ways. By far, the, the, the most common way is what we refer to as a horizontal transmission. And this is where you have fish to fish contact. The pathogen is either spread from fish to fish via the water, uh, the same water that these fish are in, or uh, by cannibalism. Um, you know that whenever fish die, whenever they start getting sick, the other fish within that cage or pond, they're immediately going to start uh, trying to eat or cannibalize those animals. So that would be a horizontal type transmission. But there are other pathogens that could be spread from the parents to the offspring. And we call this a vertical transmission. So from the parental strains, or the parental fish all the way down to their offspring, there are certain 
certain viruses and certain bacteria that can be spread. And so that would be a management of the disease from a, uh, from a brood fish standpoint, where you may not want to use those particular brooders if you know that they have been through, uh, for example, a viral infection that has the potential to have that vertical transmission. You may want to cull those fish out from the population and not use them in your broodfish program. So that leads us into, as a summary of what we have been talking about. And this is what we refer to as the classic uh, disease risk paradigm and the Venn diagram to illustrate how all of these things that we've talked about, knowing and understanding the fish, knowing and understanding the environment, and knowing and understanding the characteristics of the pathogen, how when all three of these things come together, there is a level of disease risk that you have to take into consideration. So if we had a, a bad environment that causes stress to the animal, that will, and the presence of the pathogen is there, we have a much higher disease risk potential for disease development and eventual mortality rates that could affect the farm. However, if we keep a pathogen out by doing surveys or health screenings on fish before we bring them onto a farm and we eliminate that pathogen from ever being introduced, well, that's gonna significantly reduce our disease risk. If we take the environment and we keep good water quality so that it's not stressing the animal, well, that brings this circle out and it would significantly reduce our disease risk. Taking care of the fish uh, during transport or providing good um, nutrition through a well-manufactured feed, um, that is going to lead to less stress on the animal or the fish host so that it will ultimately reduce your disease risk as well. So keep this picture in mind and think about these things from, um, from a disease management standpoint on the farm. So to give two examples of this, uh, this Venn diagram, the first of these is, is a, this mortality pattern here. And it goes back into something uh, that Brandon was talking about earlier on. And this was some data that was provided to me from a farm. And it shows a couple of things that happen, and it, especially in regard to record keeping. So the first, so we've got mortality percentages over here on your y-axis and time on your x-axis right here. And this is a day-to-day -day mortality pattern um, as uh, the farm staff was picking up the mortalities that were occurring. So when the fish were initially stocked right here at day zero, we see this little spike right here in the mortality. Well, that's to be expected because sometimes when fish are being netted, uh, they're either stressed or you may have like some bad uh, netting practices where it pinches fish. Um, and you typically do have some mortalities for the first few days after an initial stocking event. But then as time goes on, things kind of flatten out. But then about starting at about two weeks out, we start having this spike in mortalities. And this is a very classic example of columnaris disease, which is a facultative organism. It's present in all freshwater systems, but it is a very common uh, pathogen and results in disease episodes that we typically see, especially after a stress episode. And so if we look at this and we look at this mortality pattern, we see this columnaris as it starts building out here, starting at about two weeks. And we have this little peak, but then all of a sudden it'll start dropping off. Very classic event of columnaris. But what could you have done to be able to anticipate this happening? Well, it all goes back to this initial event right here where the fish are 
um, initially harvested and transported into a new culture unit. It has to do with your practices that happened at this event right here two weeks prior. And so that goes back to the things that Brandon was talking about as far as record keeping. If you had not bothered to keep any kind of records and knew what was happening during this event right here, well, that could potentially impact what this mortality curve could be like. It, depending on your practices, it could be much higher or much lower or even non-existent um, at all. So good record keeping will help you understand these events like this that occur. And then finally, I want to to leave you with a classic example of that Venn diagram where you have a compromised host, a bad environment, and uh, pathogens that are present. I showed this picture earlier, um, and I want to come back because it is a classic example of that Venn diagram and how all these things come together um, to form a disease episode and a mortality event. And I usually refer to this uh, this picture and this story as what really killed the fish isn't necessarily what killed the fish. And let me explain. So this is our uh, channel catfish that we grow here in the U.S. And this particular animal was uh, roughly around a, a half a kilo in size, um, as well as its counterparts. Um, when these fish were harvested. And it was in the middle of the summertime here in the U.S. Water temperatures were running around 32, 33 degrees high, uh, C, which is almost at the upper temperature threshold for this animal to begin with. So we're in real high temperatures for this particular species. The stress levels within this animal are extremely high at this point. So we go through the, the, the production team harvested these animals out of a pond. They took this animal and they moved them into a concrete raceway or vat and held them for four days. They then sold this, this particular fish or this group of fish to a producer who took the animals and transported them onto another farm and stocked them into a cage. Well, because of the high temperatures, the animals were already under stress. They were transported into a and moved into a concrete vat where they were moved into a new home. They were trying to get adjusted to that. And then they got transported again into a cage. Well, they just simply do not like that kind of movement, especially at those temperatures and the size of fish that these fish were. And when they got into the cage, the first thing that they tried to start doing was trying to escape the cage. By doing that, they started abrading the skin due to rubbing themselves up against the side of the cage. And it started opening up these portals of entry for a bacteria. So from a diagnostic lab standpoint, whenever we got the fish into the diagnostic lab, had we simply done the diagnostics, what we come up with was these fish were severely infected with the bacterium Aramonas hydrophila. However, we could have left it at that. We said that this was an Aramonas hydrophila infection and prescribed some antibiotics, and that would have been the end of the story. Um, however, that wasn't teaching the producer everything that happened and what led up to that event so that they could learn from the experience and then apply it, that newfound information later on whenever the same thing happened, uh, when, the, when they purchased fish and moved them into a new environment. So when you go back and you look at the history of this fish, it's a large fish. It does not like to be moved in high temperatures. It, this particular species does not like to be moved from a pond into a cage at these types of peak metabolic temperatures. Um, it just simply was a bad situation from, from the beginning um, when the fish were harvested. 
if the fish had been harvested and moved whenever the water temperatures were say 10 or 15 degrees, this fish probably would have done very well. We would not have had the episode that the producer encountered. If this had been a much smaller fish, they would have probably, because behavioral wise, smaller fish adjust much better than a larger fish, they probably would have survived this type of event and we wouldn't have had the mortalities that we did. Um, and the, the smaller fish would have survived this event much better. But because the producer did not know and understand how these fish were going to react, they were put from one culture unit into a completely different type and didn't know and understand how these particular animals were going to react by moving that different culture, moving them into those different culture systems, as well as the potential presence of certain pathogens that that body of water already had and contained within it. It just led to a perfect storm of that Venn diagram where the disease risk potential was very, very large. Had they had these ideas and these concepts about what was going on, then a lot of this could have been prevented. So it really wasn't the Aramonas that killed the animal, even though that is what killed it. Really, it was everything that happened the week before, starting with the harvest of the animal and then transporting that animal into new culture units and stressing the fish to the point where it succumbed to the pathogen that we diagnosed out of the animal. So this is a classic example of everything that happened to the animal, starting with taking the animal and harvesting it led to the mortality event. And this is really what caused the death of this animal. It was starting with the moving the fish, harvesting the fish, in these real high temperatures, and then the process thereafter. It really wasn't necessarily the pathogen itself that ultimately killed the animal. Uh, it, it was really everything that happened to the animal and set the animal up before that point.